Hey, what's up? How you been? Good. Good to see you guys. Hey, welcome to the podcast. We haven't figured out what to name it yet, so we're just going to name it podcast because that's what it is. We thought of Godcast. That sounds really good, but I don't know. We'll we'll see. Keep coming up with your suggestions. That'll be cool. Today I have a mighty man of God I've known for quite a long time. His name's Peter Lewis, and I'd just love for you to tell them about you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, bro. Thank we have you. known each Dude, other for like you. 15 years almost. Yeah. We uh, which feel like we grew up together. Crazy, yeah. <laughs> Um, though I don't look, do I look like I could know someone for 15 years? No, dude, but I do. I do. <laughs> You've aged well. Yeah, I'm 52, so I've known. I still don't believe that. Yeah, it is true. Um, about me, what, which, which part about me? What's, I mean. Um, how about like, how about the reality of Peter Lewis and his testimony? And where does yeah. Peter Lewis come from? How did you come to know the Lord? Yeah. And like, what was your encounter like? I know they're continual. Yep. You taught it today. Yeah. You brought it today mm. at LCU. Um, what What is Peter Lewis? What is, I know you're about Jesus. I know you're about intimacy. Yeah. I know that. But where did you come from? And how did you get to where you're at? It's a good question. Um, first of all, I think I have the best mom and dad in the world. So um, good. They're amazing. Uh, just raised me in the faith. Um, one of my big part of my testimonies, my little brother died of cancer when I was four years old. Um, if you know anything about the divorce rates, um, it's really high for couples who lose a child. And my parents, uh, their, through their faith in the Lord, through community, um, and their yes to one another, they're still together, love each other. And so I credit so much of just the, the inheritance. We receive that which we didn't earn. You know, you reap where you don't sow. And so uh, my parents are my heroes, raised me in the faith. My mom led me to the Lord. Um, so prayed the prayer when I was like seven or eight years old. Really? My brother, Andrew. Do you remember it? Oh yeah. My big brother. So we were in New Jersey visiting my aunt and uncle and my brother was asking something about heaven and hell. And so they thought I was asleep and I heard my mom telling the gospel to my brother and it came and I was listening like intently, you know, and it came time. She was like, well, do you want to pray and receive Jesus and, you know, live forever? And I like popped up. I'm like, I do. And I remember feeling my heart like beat out of my chest, like laying there. No they way. thought I was asleep, but I was like listening to their conversation. And so I gave my life to the Lord and um, and grew up. I, I was a soccer player, so I loved soccer, played in college, played professionally for a little bit. Um, that was my you passion. You played pro ball? I did Get for a little here, bit. Dude. So I, I got drafted by FC Dallas in their very last pick. So I was, you know, last one. And then I played in Finland for a few seasons. So just amazing season and testimony. Um, but I tell people, I was like the guys in Acts 19. So I was the disciples of Apollos. Yeah. Eloquent in the scriptures, fervent in the spirit, accurately teaching Jesus, but he only knew John, John's baptism. So oh, he wow. only taught forgiveness of sins. <laughs> and so, you how, know... That, how long was that period? That was from, you know, 8 to to 22 okay maybe so for right. a while and i had encountered the holy spirit here and there at different you know a youth camp or we, there was a revival meeting in our neighborhood and i experienced the presence of god there didn't know that's what it was but i did so i was at a uh my brother actually got filled with the spirit in law school in virginia and he oh came home gosh. in 2005 and he goes bro he goes you got to listen to this guy named bill johnson and we were like, who's Bill Johnson, you know? So we started listening to Bill. We went on a negativity fast. So we did, me, my dad, and my brother did 40 days, no negative word out of our mouth. And it, like, positioned me. Um, and then 2006, I went to the Amber Rose Healing Conference at Gateway was hosting. Bill Johnson, Randy Clark, Jack Taylor, Lance Wall now. Um, I was, had been addicted to pornography had partially torn my MCL and was at training camp at FC Dallas and was just a mess and was believing God. Like I got real with God, like end of 05, I was like, God, this thing owns me, this pornography addiction. I hate it. I don't want it, uh, but it owns me. And I was like, you say you're powerful, but this thing is more powerful. And I just got real with God for the first time in a long time. Go to this conference, 
signed up for the healing time. So they were like, what do you need healing for? I didn't know how it worked. I thought it was a weird game of bingo, you know, where they're like, <laughs> maybe they'll call it from the front. So I didn't want to say porn addiction. So I put knee because I need my MCL was partially torn and I put heart. And so because if, if they were like, oh, you know, I was going to claim some heart disease if they did it publicly. And anyway, so I went up. It wasn't public, but these people prayed for me. Uh, praying in tongues. I'd never really heard tongues before. That was new. I was a Bible church kid, really, you know, grew up in the Bible church. And, um, and man, the power of God hit me. And so I tell people, God pulled out my SIM card, got filled with the spirit, got delivered of porn, like in a moment, like he, I was shy, introverted, like I was a mess. And man, he, I am still reeling from that encounter, March 9th, 2006. Um, wow, bro. so yeah, so that's kind of my, that was that power encounter that really marked my life. And then, man, to be honest, it was about three years of, you know, Bill and, um, really it was Bill. <laughs> I was podcasting Bethel for the three years I was playing professionally, um, yeah. just renewing my mind to the kingdom, but I didn't understand righteousness. I didn't understand the gospel. Yeah. Um, and so that became a journey really starting in 2010, um, I started, God really started highlighting righteousness in the gospel, and he marked me when we were, my wife and I moved down to be a part of the upper room. It was just a prayer meeting, those early days, you yeah. remember? Yeah. Um, I had this encounter in my kitchen, and this oil dumped all over my feet. My feet, I had bare feet. I was bare feet and I was unpacking this bag and oil dumped out. I thought you were like oil just appeared all over my no, feet. No, no, it was, was a okay. real oil. Okay. It was just yeah. like misplaced yeah. and it dumped on my feet, Whoa. but the presence of God filled my kitchen. He said, son, I'm anointing your feet to run with the gospel. Wow. And I sat there and I said, Lord, I remember saying this to him. I said, I'll run if you teach me the gospel like you taught Paul. And I said, because I don't, the gospel I heard, it didn't have that like power, didn't have the yeah. dunamis, you know? And so... Man, that's been that's been twelve years now, and it so just good. keeps getting better or worse, however you frame it. That is so good. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, I, what would you consider yourself your office right now, as far as the fivefold? And I don't know. I don't think Isn't I'm super. Hard? Yeah. Like, I. Are you I've, pastor? I've operated, are you pastor Peter? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I've operated a lot pastorally, and, and you know how this is. It shifts over the years. It's like God does different things initially. I mean, I was the guy on the streets. Everyone's like, he's an evangelist, you know, because I was preaching the gospel. and like, that's what evangelists do. They preach the gospel, you know, and my heart is for, I think my heart is really for the church. So so teacher, pastor, that right, right in there, you know, um, I really want people to be mature. Yeah. in the Lord yeah. and to see and to see them grow up into him. I think it's the greatest need of the hour. That's I right. really do. That's so good. What do you feel the I mean of course the Holy Ghost, but what do you feel the the key to maturity is? I mean it uh, uh, you and I kind of we speak the same language. Mm -hmm. So it's like I'm asking me questions. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> I love it because your heart is so your heart is so for righteousness and the church yeah. has stepped away from that and kind of gone after how can we appease the people mm -hmm. but nothing appeases people mm -hmm. righteousness is the only thing that keeps you yeah and so what do you feel the quickest way to maturity is well there's no quick way yeah. um i think it starts with with understanding who he is it's it's begins and ends with jesus that's a given yeah. um but i think i think it's understanding i think we we have to be we can't be afraid to define what successful maturity looks like. Yeah. And I think we've done that as a church. We've kind of danced around it. What is maturity? It seems elusive. Is it if you have gray hair, if you've been in the church a long time? And I think, I think defining maturity is really important. I think maturity is looking like Jesus yeah. in, in thought, in emotions, in deed, in spirit, that when people see us, they see him. And really, and really marking that freedom from sin, intimacy with God, and then a life filled with fruit, I think that's maturity. And so I think defining it. And then the other thing I would say is, is um, this, this is sort of, a, a, I guess, a parable, if you will, the Lord gave me. He, says, he said, son, which one of my creations tries to be what I created it to be? And I thought about it for a second. Yeah. And I was like, none of them. 
And he goes, no. He goes, there's one. He says, Christians. That's the only one. They try to be what I created them to be. And he says, you prove that you don't trust my design or understand my design yeah. when you try to be what I created you to be. So I think if we can help the church understand the design, how things grow, how we grow in the new covenant, I think we can see, we'll see massive breakthrough yeah. in that regard. I love the, the example. I heard Dan Muller. Mm-hmm. He said an apple tree doesn't sit out there and scream, apples! Yes. Apples! It's like the Christian trying to be a Christian mm-hmm. because you are one. Mm-hmm. And seeing who God created you to be is it's the reality of the, the fruit that hangs on your tree mm. because the vine is totally healthy, man. Yes. And I just, I love it. This morning you said some things. So I was taking notes, I took notes the whole time. It was great. I have a whole page full. It, it was really good. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I don't know if you, can, if you can do it in a short amount of time, but you shared about the reality of the gospel, and it starts in Genesis. Mm. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a long one because it starts there, you know? But it's the reality of, of God being okay with man because he fellowship with man without sin because Adam was without sin. Mm. And then they fell. And so Jesus restored us to that. He restored that which was lost. Mm. And so, you know, you said about being free from sin just a couple minutes ago, or a minute or two ago. That is such a struggle for the church, buddy, because like, you're labeled a heretic if you say you can be free from sin. Mm. It is like the craziest thing. But the Bible teaches you exactly the opposite. Like you need to be free from sin. Yeah. You talked about his coming and us not being thinking about his coming. Because when I look at that, like I want to stand before him and be holy now. I want to be blameless now mm. so that I'll definitely be blameless then. Yes. You know, because I've got to make sure that like I want to make sure that I'm living pure here. Yes. And that's the heart cry of this thing. Yes. So, I, I mean, I, that's a whole bunch. But can you, I don't even know how you could do it, man, because I took so many notes. But is there any way you can sum up what you shared about the gospel? And you shared about the, you know, the four points. And then you shared, I didn't catch the end because you didn't share it. I was waiting for you to share it. So when we're done here, you're going to give me the rest of that. Okay. You know, grace, righteousness. Yeah. And, yeah. But if you can just sum it up, because there's a lot of people that want to share their faith. Mm-hmm. But they don't know how to share the gospel. Right. And so that would be great. Because yeah. even though you're teaching and pastoral, that's the God, that's evangelistically, that's how we need to share the faith. Right. You know? So if you could do that. That'd be great, man. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> you got seven minutes, man. Oh wow, that's <laughs> terrible. Um, I think I think one of the most important things we can start with is that it does start in the garden. That the gospel starts pre-fall. Yeah. The gospel message doesn't start with the fall of man. It starts with a God who created in love. That's right. Um, and that's the glory that we fell from. And and that's so important to understanding the cross and who Jesus is and what He's done. Um, I think the second kind of main point was that it took time for sin to really jack us up. And so as believers and sharing our faith with the world, with other believers, we've got to understand that it took time for sin to mess us up, and it's going to take righteousness some time to to redeem us, us, to clean us up, and to form Christ in us. And so that should give us patience as we share the gospel. It's not just to get people born again, but to see every mark in, in scar of sin removed. Um, and then I would say the biggest thrust and heart of the message this morning was seeing that the gospel isn't just the proclamation of Jesus as the Lamb of God, though that's tremendous and huge and important. But when he said, it is finished, he didn't say, I am finished. That's right. And that was had, so good. And he ascended on the 40th day. He now lives as our high priest. And one day he's promised to come back and marry us. And I really believe that within those three revelations, Jesus as the Lamb of God, as the high priest who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, and as the bridegroom, judge, and king, it's within those three that we that we get born again and grow up into salvation. And so I think if we're going to really proclaim this gospel and do it well, we have to become the message. We're, Luke 7, he says, wisdom shall be justified by all her children. That's right. And so if there's no fruit of the intimacy that we've had with God, people won't listen to us. I mean, we're, we're past the days of revelating and well, we're gonna, we have some revelation. It's not... 
it's not a revelation. We have fruit. We have children. There's there's life that has been begotten through this union with God. Mm-hmm. And it's the fruit, I think, that make that amplifies what we're saying. And that says, hey, you know what? This thing really works. If your gospel doesn't make you free, it doesn't connect you in intimacy and doesn't make you look like him, it's not the gospel. That's right. And I think that's not harsh. That's just allowing us to be honest and go, man. We need to be real. If we're if we've gone five years in any sort of form of Christianity and we don't see any any improvement in those three areas, we've departed from the gospel. That's right, uh, and from so salvation. Good, and so, I just think those three distinct revelations of Christ are paramount for the church to understand. Yeah. Question: You just said because uh, I know someone will caught someone will catch it because okay. they're watching me. So you said if those things don't exist, then we've departed from salvation. So I know what it means to depart from the gospel, from the message. I know what it means to depart from intimacy. Mm-hmm. But when you say depart from salvation, define that. Yeah, Peter says we can grow up <clears throat> into salvation <clears throat> if you've tasted that the Lord is good. Yeah. And so salvation is not a stagnant thing in a one-time thing. You're born again once, yet that born again experience was intended to produce an ongoing salvation. Yeah. And that salvation growth can be stagnant. Okay. Uh, Paul says you can make shipwreck of the faith by devoting yourself to knowledge. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean you're not born again? I don't think so, no. necessarily. Yeah. I think it means that you've stagnated, you're, that you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, you were born again, praise God, but you departed. Some shall depart from the faith, make shipwreck of their faith. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. I think it means that what we were intended to grow into, we, we, we stunted our growth. Yeah. And we, we didn't we failed to reach the end. And you see a lot of examples of that in the Old Testament where God intended to take them into the promised land. It was never about just getting them out of Egypt. Right. It was about getting them into the promised land so they could be a light and blessing to the nations. Yeah. But many <clears throat> failed to enter. And I think it's the same today. Many yeah. Christians fail to enter um, the fullness to what Amen. he's invited us into. So when somebody gets saved, their spirit man becomes born again. Yes. But your spirit man because salvation works itself out mm-hmm. with fear and trembling. So it works itself out through your soul, through your body. Yes. The whole being gets filled with salvation. It's not just a born again, my spirit's born again, and then one day I'm going to be with in heaven. Yes, it is about getting to heaven, but it's about heaven getting into us, then salvation working itself out, and then one day our whole being. I just love, I just love the gospel, man. I love it. I love it. I love it. It's amazing. It's so good. I just, we get hit for all these different weird things. Like people say this and this, and this isn't a defend ourselves. This is a, let's bring clarity to this because we're really on the same page. For sure. You can exalt knowledge above intimacy and grow away from God and think you know everything about God, but really not know him. Mm -hmm. And so that's. I, that right there is a, is a thing that I see all over the earth, man. Yeah. We, listen, we, <clears throat> we don't need to throw stones. I think the unity of the faith will center around the revelation of Christ as Messiah, high priest, and bridegroom. That's so right. we can squabble about the outcome of that, you know, people tongues or not tongues or the expression of the faith. We're never going to unify around the expression of the faith. Never. Meaning a worship movement, a prayer movement, a sharing right. the gospel movement. We will only unify in the perspective that he is who he says he is. That's right. And our expressions will be different. Yeah. And praise God. I thank God for that. I thank God you're on my team. I thank God, Lou. I thank God for these people where I used to compare myself and go, oh, I'm not expressing my faith that no. way. And then and then the Lord just checked me and he said, we're on the same team. Yeah. And that's so a Todd can end. be Todd. Right. Lou can be Lou. Yeah. I can be me. Yeah. You know, I love the I love the thinkers. I love the theological. Like they can be like we can all grow in humility and learn from one another. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful. That's the key, because without humility, we don't learn anything from anybody mm-hmm. because we think we know it all. Yeah, and that's a killer, man. It's dangerous. It's a big deal. You know the humbling yourself is the best way you want to go about this because we don't need God to humble us. Yes. We don't want. It's as if my people will humble themselves. Mm. Being humbled by God is the way that I don't want to go. I'd much rather yeah. humble myself, man. What do you see? Where's your heart at when it comes to America? God has not left himself without a witness. 
And I think so there's good. fires burning everywhere. And I think America's toast yeah. for the gospel. Yeah. I think, I think we are ripe. Yeah. I'm so excited to be yeah. in America right now. My heart, I, I don't even know how to explain it, how I feel towards the country right now. And where we're at, not mad, by no means mad. Excited because I believe that America is primed for the greatest witness to take place right now. And I know that's what you're saying too. I just, I want to see our country come to Jesus. It's all the, you know, first you have this COVID thing that comes in. Then you have the whole political craziness that comes in. Mm-hmm. Then you have the the squeezing, it feels like, of do this and you have to do this. And oh, gosh, and I'm like, boy, this is just, the devil is totally threatened right now. Mm-hmm. And what I'm seeing is he's putting up his his best defense as he can right now. Yes. But like when the Bible says that when the, when he comes in like a like a flood, mm. God raises up the standard. I believe the comma is in the wrong place. And then when he comes in, comma like a flood, God raises up the standard because the enemy is not a flood. Yes, like our God is the one that said that He'll cover wow. the earth, bro. And so I'm super stoked. What are you seeing in your travels and right now, as far as just different places that you're at? I'm seeing Jesus being the focus in the main thing. And that in the, in the single pursuit of, of communities throwing off everything and seeking him alone. And it's coming in the form of, of prayer. It's coming in the form of missions. It's coming in the form of worship. It's coming in the form of discipleship. But it's all unto him. And I think, I think for that reason, I'm like, it's on. Like it's, I don't think so much of what we've seen is, is antagonistic towards the gospel. I think what we're seeing exist and all the chaos yeah. has been in a vacuum of a true revelation and proclamation of the gospel. That's so true. I, I think we've preached a third of the gospel in America. Yeah. And I think as, it's, as we begin to proclaim and demonstrate in word and deed what he's like, yeah. I really, I'm just, I'm really filled with hope. And yeah. obviously my ultimate hope is he's coming, yet simultaneously we have this tension to make here look like there, yeah. right? And to see the gospel go forth. And so I'm so encouraged. It's happening in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, it's happening everywhere, the Midwest, East Coast. There's pockets, and it's just, it's really exciting. So good. Um, as, far as, as far as the two-thirds, in one minute, describe the three parts of the gospel. Yeah, and people can test this in the New Testament. It's it's everywhere. Um, we have preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as the full, the whole enchilada. Yeah. And I believe the revelation of the Lamb of God was the first of three distinct revelations. Um, he then ascended, and he now exists as our high priest. That's yep. Hebrews 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, and one day he'll come back as a bridegroom and as a judge. And those were three promises that we were given through the Father, yeah. by the Father through Israel. Yeah. Uh, he said, hey, my son's coming. He's going to come as a Messiah. He's going to come as a high priest, and he's going to come as a bridegroom, judge, and king. Yeah. And so I think when we proclaim all three, we hem in the church, and we allow them to continue in the faith and not start in the faith by grace through faith, and now I've got to continue by works through striving. Yeah. Right? The reason there's been so much by works through striving is because we failed to continue the proclamation and the ministry of the gospel, not just to get the lost saved, but to get the saved to look like him to continue in the faith. So good, bro. Yeah. Oh, guys, bless you. Love you. Tune in next time. See ya. It's good. I don't have anything. Just let me roll. That's great.